Good evening. Welcome to Bread for the World's uh, Google, Google Chat, Google Hangout. My name is uh, Eric Mitchell. I'm Director of Government Relations at Bread for the World. For those of you who aren't familiar with Bread for the World, we are a Christian grassroots advocacy organization committed to ending hunger and poverty around the world. And joining me today are three distinguished guests here to talk about food aid and food aid reform. I'm joined today by Danielle Mouton Smith, um, policy team leader for USAID, Tanya Raw, senior policy advocate at CARE, and joining me on the phone is Derek Daly, graduate student at Yale Divinity School and leading advocate within the faith community. Today, again, we're going to talk about food aid and food aid reform and how we can make it more effective and more efficient. So what is food aid? Since 1954, the United States has been the world's largest provider of life-saving food aid and has been an important part of the overall effort for, of the global exodus from hunger. We have um, been able to feed over 3 billion people in over 150 countries for over the past 60 years. Our national food aid programs are often the first line of defense against hunger in vulnerable communities, and the United States is often the first country to respond in crisis. In the past 20 years, USAID's food aid and development programs helped reduce the number of the world's chronically undernourished people by 50%. But unfortunately, food insecurity is still a major problem worldwide. Roughly one in eight people, or approximately 840 people around the world, still suffer from chronic hunger. Food aid and nourishment and the nourishment it provides can help build a foundation for long-term food security. However, despite its success, there is still a great deal of inefficiency within the food aid program. Most, most food aid must be grown in the United States. Now, this constrains our ability to be flexible in using appropriate options to obtain food in times of emergencies, even when these methods are shown to be most cost effective. Half of all food aid products must be shipped on American ships. This can take as long as six months and add as much as 60 cents for each dollar spent on food aid. And with some food aid, food is donated to a poor country and then sold there. The revenue is used to fund projects carried out by private charities or intergovernmental organizations. But this practice, also known as monetization, um, the average organization only gets about 70 cents back for every dollar spent on the sales. This practice of selling American grown food on the open market in a developing country has also been shown to sometimes undermine the livelihoods and productivity of local farmers by depressing prices in their markets. Now in the past, there have been political hurdles that have made it hard to make significant changes to our food aid programs. However, this year we have a real opportunity to reform international food aid programs so that funds are used more effectively and efficiently. Now with political will, we can achieve significant changes to the food aid programs that would allow us to feed millions of additional people each year at no additional cost to the U.S. taxpayer. Our first panelist is Danielle Smith. Danielle heads the policy unit in USAID's Office of Food for Peace. Prior to joining USAID, Danielle served as Director of Global Trade and Agricultural Policy at Women Thrive Worldwide and as both a senior policy analyst and senior church outreach associate at Bread for the World. She also served as a, on the Farmer to Farmer program at Partners of the Americas. Danielle has spent many years focusing on international development and has been, lead, and has been leading President Obama's efforts on food aid reform for over two years. Danielle Smith. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm very excited to be here to talk about uh, food aid and food aid reform and the administration's efforts in, uh, in this work. Um, to build on some of the background that Eric provided, um, Food for Peace does work in both emergency and development programs. Um, we're one of the only uh, offices at USAID that works on both the immediate humanitarian needs uh, around the world as well as longer term five-year development programs to address chronic vulnerability and food insecurity. 
Our programs focus predominantly on women and children with nutrition programs targeted to, targeted to assure um, nourishment to pregnant lactating women and children under the age of two, also known as the thousand days window. We support dozens of partners around the world. We work in over 40 countries um, and we reached about 47 million people in just FY13 alone, so I'm sorry, fiscal year 13. Our emergency programs draw on two different types of assistance or two different accounts. Um, traditionally, we have been uh, funded through agriculture appropriations and what's called Title II. The program, that's a traditional food for peace program where we ship U.S. commodities overseas. We're authorized through the Farm Bill, through the Food for Peace Act. And this has been the staple of U.S. food aid for over 60 years. Um, in 2010, we started to also receive some flexible funds through the International Disaster Assistance Account, about $300 million a year. Uh, and this allows us to also purchase locally and regionally closer to the site of emergencies, as well as to provide vouchers or transfers to families that are in need on the ground. So they can purchase food in their lo local markets or from local vendors, allows them more choice, uh, and helps to support the local communities that are also in need. Our development programs are funded through, uh, through Title II, through the Farm Bill programs, uh, and they are generally five-year programs. Uh, we provide food transfers as part of those programs, but there's also a lot of other services that our partners implement, agricultural productivity, nutrition programs, um, education programs, literacy, uh, irrigation, a wide array of programs to help, again, address those chronic needs um, and address the root causes of food insecurity and poverty. Monetization um, really arose as a workaround to the fact that the original Food for Peace program was all commodities, and our development partners on the ground uh, needed cash to also implement those complementary activities that address the root causes of uh, hunger and poverty. And so monetization became a process for those organizations, our partners, to be able to access the, the cash that they needed to do those programs on the ground. We didn't have that flexibility in the original program legislation from Congress. So why are we seeking food aid reform? Um, Eric alluded to some of the, the main reasons, but from our perspective, we're facing, as an agency, tightening budgets uh, and increased need. And so we're looking at ways that, that we can um, stretch our dollars even further. So we know that over the, through our experience with local regional purchase, with vouchers and cash transfer programs, as well as a large amount of research that's out there, that we can save, on average, 20 to 30 percent by using these other uh, methods of providing food assistance to people who are in need. So our first, our first priority here is making our dollars go further. We can use other methods to uh, to reach those in need. We can make we can uh, reach more people um, and make our make our program go even further. We estimate that uh, if we were to this year's proposal, 25% flexibility. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute we'd be able to reach between two to three million more people on average every year without increasing the budget of the program. Um, it's more efficient. Uh, as I just said, we can save 20 to 30 percent. It's a lot faster. Local regional purchase can take a few weeks, whereas shipping from the U.S. overseas can take four to six months. So in a time of crisis when people are hungry, four to six months, it could be a matter of life and death. And so having the flexibility to look at a situation and determine what's the best tool. Should we be shipping from the U.S. or do we need that food on the ground in the next few weeks? And in that case, let's buy it locally, let's get it to the people right away. Um, and it allows us to really pick the right tool at the right time. There are some places where uh, U.S. commodities are really needed. When we were faced with the crisis in the Horn of Africa back in 2007, 2008, there wasn't a lot of food to be found in the region to purchase. Uh, we wouldn't be, have been able to really provide people with uh, vouchers or cash transfers to go buy food in the market. It was very sparse. So we needed the U.S. commodities to really bolster the food response there and provide people with the nourishment that they needed. Um, in other situations, like Syria right now, we can't use U.S. commodities if we can't get 
U.S. people commodities into a conflict area like Syria. Um, and you know, in, in our refugee response around Syria, we also want to support the markets that are there and functioning. Uh, and so we use largely uh, transfers and uh, vouchers for, for the refugee population. It's the right tool for that situation. So food aid reform last year uh, was kind of the first year that the Obama administration went forward. And in 2014, what we were proposing uh, was 45% flexibility to use our Title II resources uh, for local income purchase vouchers and transfers. Um, we did not achieve that in, in last year's appropriation process, but at the same time, the Farm Bill was going forward, and I mentioned before that Food for Peace is authorized through the Farm Bill. Um, through the Farm Bill process, we did, we did receive increased flexibility through something called 202 e um, It's a section of the Food for Peace Act. It's very wonky and in the weeds, but it's a section of the Food for Peace Act that does allow our partners some cash to be able to enhance their programs and do complementary services um, and move the food and do what they need to do to get it to, to, to get it to people. So they broaden the use of those funds and increase the amount that we have access to so that we can do some local regional purchase, we can do um, some voucher programs, and we can eliminate monetization um, in almost every country around the world. We'll continue it in one country. There is a minimum in the Farm Bill still that we need to meet but we can pretty much eliminate it everywhere else. And this is a real success for us. This is going to allow our partners to be very innovative in their programming and really make our programs much more efficient and effective. Um, this year, we came back with a slightly modified uh, approach, 25% flexibility through our Title II programs. We lowered the percentage because we were responding to the changes that were already in the Farm Bill, and we're also responding to some of the concerns that we heard from Congress about going too fast too soon. Um, so, what we're hoping to do is, this year is, is really achieve increased flexibility through uh, our Title II programs to allow us uh, to make the best decisions when we're trying to serve those, those people most in need at some of their most vulnerable times. I, I just want to give one example of how having these different tools in our tool basket uh, really allows us uh, to make the best programming decisions. When Typhoon Yolanda hit the Philippines, um, a few months ago, we had we were on the ground within days, uh, and we used pretty much every tool in our toolbox to to reach those in need within the first hours of the crisis. We flew in um, ready to use foods, kind of um, emergency food bars, so that those people who were without shelter, without access to cooking materials, could immediately eat. They're like food replacement bars. We think like a Cliff Bar or something like that. It's kind of like that, but dense, caloric, has the right proteins and, and um, uh, right balance of nutrients in it to, to kind of keep people nourished and going. We got those on the ground right away. Um, then we used local and regional procurement to buy rice on the ground and get it into people's uh, disbursements within the first couple of days as well. We then moved food from our pre-positioning warehouse in Colombo, Sri Lanka that arrived two weeks later. That's actually U.S. rice, but we store it in Sri Lanka so that it's ready to go when there are crises like this hits. We have seven of those around the world that help us to um, stock up, stockpile resources, and then we can move it where we need it to very quickly. So that arrived two weeks later. And then at the same time, we purchased rice in the U.S. That took until February to arrive, and that was an expedited process. So you can see how if we had just had the Title II, we wouldn't have been able to be on the ground at the first hours of the crisis when people were most in need. But what we were able to do was stagger our response and respond in, to the immediate and long-term needs of the crisis and as people are recovering. And so that's what we're really talking about here. We're not talking about having an all-cash system or an all-commodity system, but having a, a blend of resources available to us so that we can really choose what's right, what's best, um, and uh, in, in our humanitarian response. Thank you, Danielle. Our next panelist is Tanya Raw. Tanya is a senior policy advocate for CARE USA. She, she joined CARE's policy and advocacy unit in 2008 and has led CARE's advocacy on food and nutrition security as well as climate change. She analyzes U.S. and global policy, policy of global hunger and climate change and represents CARE on Capitol Hill to the U.S. administration and 
within the NGO community. Tanya has also served as a member of, CARE, of CARE's delegation to international climate change negotiations and is a co-author of Where the Rain Falls, a global policy report based on an eight-country research study on climate change, food security, and migration. Tanya. Great. Thanks so much, Eric, and good evening, everyone. I, I want to thank all of you for being with us tonight. Um, having advocates engaged in this kind of process is really one of the most critical pieces to achieving really good policy change. Um, I want to start just with a brief introduction to CARE, and, and that provides a little bit of context for some of the decisions that we've taken in the last 10 years around the U.S. food aid system. CARE is a comprehensive humanitarian and development organization. We work in emergencies, we work in agriculture, girls' education, um, women's health, across the board, water, you name it, we work on it. And that's really because we're looking at helping empower women and girls and their families and their communities to lift themselves out of poverty. CARE started just after World War II with care packages. Um, many of us today think of care packages as, you know, cardboard boxes of cookies that arrive from our parents when we're in college. But really it started as an effort to bring Americans together who wanted to respond to the needs that they saw in the war ravaged parts of Europe and Asia following World War II. So our origins are in the idea of making sure that people in need have access to adequate nutritious food and in responding to emergencies. In the 65 years that CARE has been around, though, we've also recognized the importance of evolving with the times. So instead of still working to deliver food from the U.S. to parts of Europe and Asia, um, we are now working in over 70 developing countries, as I said, across the spectrum of development and humanitarian needs. And that's really in an effort to look at the underlying causes of poverty so that we're empowering women, children, and their families to lift themselves out of poverty. We're not just putting a band-aid on the problem. That has meant, though, that we have had to take a hard look at some of the ways that our work is implemented. And in 2006, we made the decision to stop using monetization. That came at a cost of about $45 million a year for our organization. But we looked at monetization and said, you know, it doesn't make sense. As Danielle and Eric have both shared, it's incredibly inefficient. Um, 70 cents on the dollar is not the best use of U.S. taxpayer dollars. But we also felt that it was fundamentally harmful to the small-scale farmers that we're ultimately trying to help. We're trying to help them build their ability to grow enough nutritious food, both to feed their families, but also to grow their incomes and, again, lift themselves out of poverty. So we made the principal decision to walk away from up to $45 million in order to better serve the communities that we're working with. Since then, CARE has been active in advocating for modernizing the U.S. food aid system for the 21st century. I don't have to walk through a lot of the details because um, my, my co-panelists have done that extremely well. Um, but in essence, we've been advocating for two pieces. One is flexibility. As Danielle said, flexibility to use the most appropriate tool from the toolbox and to have all the tools in the toolbox. That might mean still relying on U.S. farmers. They are still a critical piece of the puzzle when it comes to responding to emergencies. But it might also mean tapping small-scale farmers in the region who are producing enough food that they themselves can sell their product to actually meet emergency needs in another country that's next door. That means that we're not just addressing emergency food needs, but we're also helping other small-scale farmers lift themselves out of poverty. The other piece that CARE has really focused on is an end to monetization. That doesn't mean that we want to end the programs that monetization funds. They're really good programs, but we need a more efficient, more effective, more responsible way of funding them. All of CARE's work on food aid reform fits into our overall advocacy effort on long-term food and nutrition security. So going back to that idea that we're using taxpayer dollars as efficiently as possible to reach as many people as possible and in ways that can actually support small-scale farmers to increase their productivity sustainably, to increase the nutrition outcomes for their families and for their communities. CARE recently, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of the tools that we leverage in our advocacy, CARE recently took a group of chiefs of staff to Ethiopia on a learning tour. 
And as part of that trip, we helped them see what food aid and food nutrition security programs look like on the ground. And we started in the first day out in the field with a visit to a distribution center where we are distributing U.S. commodities to families that for certain months of the year simply do not have enough to eat. And there is not enough food in the region that it can actually be purchased locally. So we ship U.S. commodities and those commodities are distributed. It meets the food and the nutrition security needs of those families. But on the second day, we visited with communities in a different part of Ethiopia that are starting to engage in enough economic activity that they're poised to perhaps graduate off food aid in the next few years. So we're actually working with those families to make sure that they have diverse sources of income, that they have productive agriculture, that they know about nutrition, that they're aware of the different roles that men and women can play and the importance of gender equality in tackling food and nutrition security. That's enabling those families to build their resilience, their ability to handle different types of emergencies, whether it's social, if there's a death in the family, or if it's natural, if there is a drought or uh, a flood, something of that nature. They're able to deal with those shocks, if you will. But then we also visited with farmers who are part of a program where they're actually selling their commodities that they're growing in order for those commodities to then be used in a school feeding program. The World Food Program is running this program called Purchase for Progress, and it's leveraging the ability of local small-scale farmers who are themselves poor. These folks don't have a lot of land themselves, but they're growing enough that they can sell their food and actually feed 43,000 school children in their area. Ultimately, it's about addressing that entire spectrum. So when CARE works on food aid reform, it's about making sure that we're designing all of the U.S. programs in a way that it enables families to graduate out of poverty. It doesn't keep them there. It's not just a Band-Aid. It addresses their immediate needs, but it also empowers them for the medium and the long term. When it comes to doing that, um, when, it, when it comes to advocating for that kind of policy change, I think, it, I can't remember if it was Eric or Danielle, but there, it's been a steep climb. Um, there's been some political opposition um, to modernizing these programs for the 21st century. So in the last several years, CARE has itself just used every tool in our own advocacy toolbox. We have staff here in Washington who are meeting with members of Congress and their staff to help write parts of the Farm Bill. Um, we have staff who are meeting with Danielle and her colleagues to talk about the US's, uh, U.S. government's the administration's reform proposal. We're also using creative means of getting out the message to the American public, um, putting together infographics that demonstrate that the system, the way it's set up, might look a little bit like a dinosaur, and that there are actually different ways that we can set it up that really poise us for some great change. We've developed a video. Um, it's on CARE's website uh, with a video about local and regional purchase, just educating folks about the issue and how we can make it better. We're using our learning tours, as I mentioned, the tour to Ethiopia. And that's actually where we're able to help members of Congress and their staff see what these programs look like, see how U.S. taxpayer dollars are used. But then we're also working with partners like Bread for the World, um, a very critical partner in this effort. And then we're working with advocates like you. Um, as I mentioned, thank you for being here. Having advocates on the ground in different states and districts in the U.S really is a critical piece of effecting policy change when it comes to things like food aid reform. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, next, finally, we have Derek Daly. Derek is a current graduate student at Yale Divinity School. He is pursuing a Master's of Arts in Religion with concentration in Black Religion in the African diaspora. At Yale, he has completed research on food insecurity and contemporary advocacy strategies. Derek has served in numerous civic capacities. He was a member of the board of directors for a local United Way while studying um, in his undergraduate, or studying as an undergraduate in both Missouri. He is currently serving his second three-year term as a national board member for the World. And he was in the inaugural class of the Congress Leaders for Bread for the World in 2008. Since then, Derek has acted for food policy reform locally and nationally. Derek David. 
Thank you, Eric. I hope everyone can hear me uh, through the microphone. Um, I think, let me say, I, I think it's probably an act of God that I finally made it on the call. So uh, thanks to everyone behind the scenes who made, made this possible. It's uh, really, really a delight to be a part of this esteemed panel. Danielle and Tanya, um, thank you. And Eric, thank you as well. Um, I want to start and say a little bit about Bread for the World and what uh, drives me to continue uh, the advocacy work that I do. Um, and then sort of shift into um, what this means theologically, but also what this means for poor and hungry people. Um, for many of you uh, listening um, or, or tuning in, you probably know that Bread for the World is a collective Christian voice of activists all over the country um, attempting to end hunger and poverty uh, in our time. Um, it's important to know that in a couple of years we're going to celebrate 50 years of doing this work. Um, and this is 50 years of uh, heartache, of struggle, uh, but 50 years of victory and celebration where we've uh, accomplished a lot for poor and hungry people, not just here in America, but all around the world. Um, Art Simon uh, started the organization um, in the early 1960s uh, where the civil rights movement was at its um, most central point um, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And he, along with many members of his local Lutheran congregation, but also churches um, in the area, uh, got together uh, first to do local work um, around issues of justice, uh, but then uh, they felt the need to make this um, a work that uh, was national, make this a work where um, local people, church members, people of faith uh, could work together uh, to impress upon uh, national decision makers to do more and for hungry and poor people. And so uh, one of the reasons why I'm so committed to Bread for the World is because um, unlike so many organizations, Bread for the World deeply, deeply believes that ending hunger is possible. Um, and for everyone tuning in, know that we're not in the clouds, we're not idealists, we're people of faith um, who deeply believe that this is possible and it's possible in our lifetime. Um, I also want to say that for me, um, as a student of theology, um, but also as a person of faith, hunger is something that um, is, is an interfaith enterprise. And so advocating um, for policy and for legislation uh, that protects hungry and poor people is not something just for Christians or just for Muslims or just for uh, Buddhists, but it's an interfaith enterprise. Um, it's also an ecumenical enterprise, so um, in the same way, it's not just a Methodist work or Baptist work. And anyone who's been in the church long enough, you know uh, that oftentimes we can get divided uh, based on our own religious commitment, whether how we grew up, uh, what church we belong to. Um, and certainly for my generation, as religiosity uh, decreases, and really as a spirituality, a robust spirituality uh, increases, it's important to note that doing this kind of work has no boundaries, no bounds around hunger work and hunger advocacy. And, and I want to say a bit about what I mean with respect to the interfaith piece. Globally, what we see is that nearly 60, 65, 66 percent of the entire world um, is committed to one of the three major religious traditions, whether they be Christian, Muslim, or Hindu. And I want you to just think for a moment about how many people that really is around the world. And every single major religion in the world, at the core of their holy text, there's basic fundamental beliefs around justice, around fairness, around loving your neighbor as yourself. Whether you're reading in the Quran, the Hebrew Bible, the Gospel, whether it's Mahayana Buddhism, nearly every major religion at its core, seeks justice. And so what that tells me is that there are millions of people, not just in America, but around the world, who feel deeply convicted about what it means to do justice and love mercy in the world. And so that's good news for, for advocates. That's good news for groups like Dread for the World and CARE. In fact, it's good news for governments all over the world who, quite frankly, need people who are deeply convicted to continue to push them to enact policies that do more for hungry and poor people. Um, the other piece is that the ecumenical piece around uh, 
uh, hunger advocacy, is that today in America uh, we see a generation of people who are less committed to religious tradition and much more committed to doing justice and doing the, exactly the kinds of things that Bread for the World um, has done for so long. In fact, uh, as an undergrad in the middle of Missouri, um, I uh, sort of drunk the Bread for the World Kool-Aid in 2008 uh, and got to D.C. as a hunger justice leader and I left there and, and took my own passion back to the middle of Missouri. And while I was at Westminster College, there was this great uh, sort of thirst for doing something uh, around issues of hunger and poverty. And so we gathered a team of students, um, sophomores, juniors, students from all over the country um, to just advocate locally. And I can remember one particular experience. We took a trip to Columbia, Missouri. And at the time, there was a senator from Missouri named um, uh, Senator Blunt, Senator Roy Blunt. And we met with Senator Blunt. Um, and we were conservative Republican senator and we were advocating on a particular issue. And for the first time in my lifetime, uh, did I realize that my voice mattered. Because after that meeting, um, I can't remember if it was LaVita or Zach, someone in the Chicago office called the members of the Westminster Poverty Initiative and told us uh, that this particular senator had co-signed uh, one of the pieces of legislation that Bread for the World had advocated for. I, I tell that story because oftentimes this kind of work um, can create a kind of apathy. Uh, dealing with Washington and dealing with politicians, dealing with data and statistics, you can get burnt out over some time. But it's important for people to know that this work, it's not only good work, but this work gets results. And believe it or not, our congressmen and women, our senators, they're listening. And the only way to make good on all the great things that uh, Danielle and Tanya have talked about, whether it's about increased flexibility, whether it's about more efficiency, whether it's about making certain that food aid is more nutritious. All of this work requires convicted advocates and activists from across the country tuning in and staying engaged locally but nationally and internationally to push our decision makers to do more uh, for hungry and poor people. So I'm just excited to be uh, part of the panel. Um, I feel like I'm sort of representing a new generation of hunger advocates um, who are deeply convicted um, and deeply engaged. And so I applaud uh, Bread for the World for this innovative uh, way uh, to engage more people. Um, and thank you, Eric, Tanya, and Danielle for, for sharing this space uh, with me. I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Derek. So I actually have a number of questions from the audience, just so you guys can kind of get a sense of our audience. We have a number of students who are from different seminaries, um, undergraduate and graduate, who are actually tuned in to us right now. So they've, they've asked a number of uh, engaging questions. I think this first question will probably go to Danielle. Um, and then, Tanya, you know, feel free to, for folks to add on afterwards. But uh, what do you say to those who say that food aid reform is going to negatively impact U.S. jobs? That's a, that's a good question. Good question, and one that um, we were often asked when we were up educating members of Congress on the reform proposal. Um, there's no doubt that a change like this is going to have some impact. The program has largely been U.S. commodities going across the ocean on U.S. ships. So any change where we're talking about buying more locally or providing people with vouchers to purchase locally means that there's going to be less volumes from the U.S. I mean, there's just, just really no way kind of around that. But I think we have to put it in perspective of, of, the, of the industry as a whole. We talk about um, agricultural exports. What we buy every year, uh, it makes up about half of 1% of U.S. ag exports. The change we're talking about would drop that to about 0.3% of 1%. 0.3 of 1%. So it's a really small change, but it's a really small part of what makes up a very vibrant uh, industry. So the impact on ag would be pretty minimal. Um, we've also gotten quite a bit of support for these reform efforts from, uh, from agricultural groups. Um, I was just out 
at the National Farmers Union Convention uh, a couple of weeks ago, talking to farmers there, and many of them actually thought we already did this uh, at a much larger scale than we than we do, and thought it made a lot of sense. They thought we should be supporting farmers overseas to be able to feed themselves and their communities. And so while they were very happy to be part of uh, the effort to address hunger overseas, they also thought that, the, the, that it should be empowering people to, to also address um, their you know, their issues you know, on the ground. So uh, they also came out, this, this, the National Farmers Union came out with a statement last year um, in support of these efforts, as well as Cargill and Lando Lakes. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of support coming from, from that sector. And so I think what we've always emphasized is that this is not an end to uh, the role of U.S. farmers and U.S. agriculture uh, in food assistance, but it's just kind of a modernizing of the effort so that we have a broader toolbox. In terms of um, the, the shipping industry, and I'll let Tanya talk maybe more to the politics of it, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but in terms of the impact, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a, um, a labor economist, um, and there are some uh, programs going on right now, some research going on uh, to, to look more into this. Uh, but the Department of Defense uh, estimated that the proposal would impact about four to six ships. And on those ships, about 40 to 60, 60 mariners who, who work on them. So we're talking probably about 160 to 250 jobs. Um, but again, I think what, what they were careful to, what we've been careful to say is these are impacted vessels, impacted mariners. These aren't people who are losing their jobs. Many of them don't just do food aid. They have other. Um, they have access to other uh, U.S. agency cargoes, um, and so there's. You know, they're, they're, they may see a reduced volume, but it's again a reduction, not an end to those volumes. Um, and you know, la a couple of years ago, we went from 75% cargo preference, which means we have to ship our food aid on U.S. flag vessels, to 50% cargo preference. And the difference has been about $100 million in expenses. And that's $100 million we can put right back into our programs. And so, yes, there, there's kind of a push and a pull here where there, there are some limited impacts, but we also, we also see a lot of benefits in terms of the programs. But we're very careful in how we've been constructing uh, our food aid reform proposals. We've been talking to our colleagues at USDA, at the Department of Transportation, and MARAD, reaching out to a lot of the uh, industry groups, both in the, the ocean carriers as well as agriculture groups, to get their feedback, um, to hear their concerns, and, and to try to address that. The last thing I'll say is that the original and, and this year's proposal included a $25 million subsidy um, that would go to something called the Maritime Security Program. It's a program that already exists within the Department of Transportation to address some of the issues that the maritime industry faces. Um, it, it's, it, there's, it's, there's issues that are bigger than just kind of food aid reform, and so there is a, a program set up to try to help those, those vessels that are struggling. And so what uh, the administration did was agree to put more money into that program to help those vessels that would be impacted by food aid reform. So we really are trying to be careful in, in how we uh, and how we move forward. I'll add just a couple things. Um, the politics, the, the politics are challenging. Um, but it, one of the the shining lights on the issue of food aid reform is the fact that support for food aid reform has been phenomenally bipartisan. This is not an issue that is falling along party lines at all. And we've also seen a tremendous increase in support for reforming food aid. Um, there was a vote in the House of Representatives last June on an amendment to the Farm Bill, which would have substantially reformed U.S. food aid, and it failed by about nine votes. So it came very close to passing. There's increased support, and it's bipartisan. And that's also really then where advocates like you come in. Um, food aid is not an issue that most Americans know about. Um, you know, as Danielle said, even farmers haven't necessarily realized how much our system is still looks like it did when it was originally designed in 1954. So that's where efforts to talk to family members and friends, where those efforts come in. Because simply talking to other Americans about food aid reform is quite an amazing experience. Because as soon as you explain it, they all have this look on their face of, 
oh, oh, really? Well, that makes complete sense. And every U.S. taxpayer has a vested interest in the most responsible use of his or her taxpayer dollars. Um, so, again, you know, use the different resources that Bread for the World has, that CARE has, that other NGOs have to talk to your family members, to talk to your friends, to talk to others at your churches about food aid reform and just how much more sense it makes if our ultimate goal is to end poverty and hunger. Next question is, um, what is monetization exactly and how do you profit from it? <laughs> monetization. Um, monetization is, in its simplest form, a process whereby the U.S. government for will donate U.S. commodities to an organization like CARE, and we will then ship those commodities overseas, or they've already been shipped and then they're donated once the commodities reach a developing country. But in essence, those commodities are donated to an organization like CARE, which then would sell them in the, in the market within that country. And when I say market, I don't necessarily mean the farmer's market down the street, but in terms of like the national commodity exchange. So they get sold into the broad pot of commodities within a country. And then the revenue from that, which usually is about 70 cents on the dollar. Um, so if you get $10 worth of commodities because of the shipping and because of the administrative cost of then selling those commodities, you end up with about $7 in cash. And you can then use that $7 in cash for a program to help small scale farmers make their farming more productive, to make it more resilient to disasters, to increase nutrition for their family. So, that's the basic process itself. Um, ultimately, as Danielle said, it, the purpose was to make sure that organizations responding to emergencies can also address some of those long-term food and nutrition security challenges that families face. So the programs that are funded are incredibly valuable, but the way that we're actually funding them really doesn't quite make sense. This is the one especially where when you talk to friends and family, about how we're funding an agricultural development program, that they have that look on their face that says, but wait, that really doesn't make sense. That we would take commodities from the US, ship them to a developing country, sell them on the market in the developing country, and then use less cash than the commodities were originally worth to support small scale farmers who then try to sell their commodities on that same national market. Um, that just, that's just not logical. So that's, how I would explain monetization. I don't know. I would just add one thing. And so yeah. I think part of where it, why it, this, I mentioned before, it's a workaround. And I call it that because what we realized years ago was that trucking and dumping, which is what we kind of call, you drive it in, you throw it off the back of the truck, and you're like, okay, eat. Well, that's great to meet the needs that night or that week. But what that doesn't allow is for all the services that really need to be built in around uh, around the, the community uh, to make sure that we're having nutritional impacts, to make sure that this isn't, you know, that, that six months later we're not going to be right back in the same situation again. And the original Food for Peace Act, the original Food for Peace program didn't allow for the cash that was necessary to do the programs that Tani was just talking about, the nutritional education, the agricultural productivity, the seeds, the tools, things like that that folks need to really make a dent in food insecurity. And so monetization became the way for groups like CARE to get the cash that they needed to program around the food. And that makes the, the impact more sustainable and longer lasting. But it's not the right way to do it. And now, with the changes in the Farm Bill and that the changes that um, uh, uh, Senator Blunt and Senator um, Pryor put into the Ag Appropriations Bill and along their House colleagues that increase our level of flexibility, um, mm -hmm we're able to end monetization and just give groups the cash that they need to do this important work. Thank you. I have uh, another question. This will, I want Derek to start by answering this and then I'll lead to Tanya and Dan Gale. But the question is, you know, how do individuals in the anti-hunger community help to advocate or lobby on these issues, particularly on this issue in the current legislative session? And the second part to that question is, what have you all found to be the most effective way of, of doing it? So I'd like to start with Derek. I hope you all can hear me, but I, 
Before I answer that question, I just wanted to pick up with um, the, the last question and just simply reinforce what the, the two panelists uh, just mentioned. Is that ideally one of the things that you want to be able to do with, with food policy in general um, is to strengthen local markets. Um, and in strengthening local markets, one thing, you know, soon rather than later, you want to be able to work yourself out of a job. This hunger advocacy that we do uh, regularly is not something long term. Um, and one of the ways to ensure uh, that, um, that we're not doing this forever and ever and ever is that we um, figure out an economic and food policy system that allows for the local market, uh, wherever uh, food aid is being uh, delivered, that those markets can be strengthened. So I think that's really, really important um, for folks who are sort of new to the, to the lingo. I'm no economic expert, but one thing I do know is that um, we want to make sure that we're strengthening folks on the ground wherever they are. Um, to, to your uh, question, Eric, about uh, advocacy generally, um, one thing that I found very helpful, uh, particularly as a student, um, is uh, just picking up the phone. Um, believe it or not, um, you do get through. Uh, believe it or not, there's a, a staffer um, who answers, and it's not a recording all the time. Uh, but typically, you get through, and there's a staffer, and you can leave your message. Uh, sometimes the congressman or woman, the senator, um, will be in the office. Um, and it's quite refreshing to be able to speak directly uh, either to the person in Congress or to the staffer, uh, because it's not often that you get to share your story. Uh, it's not often that you get to um, directly communicate your passions to someone um, who's so influ influential um, in government. Um, and so picking up the phone is important. Um, writing letters, Bread for the World is certainly known for its um, letter writing campaign that it does every year. Uh, those letters have proved to be extremely effective over the years. Uh, certainly in churches, but in civic organizations, on college campuses, um, you know, put out a table in your in your uh, common room or the common hall, and just set up for an hour or so, and just pencil and paper and have folks um, have the opportunity for people to sign letters or write letters, sign our petitions. Um, one thing I can say is that Bread for the World has really made it easy for us to do advocacy. Uh, the number of resources, uh, downloadables online, uh, there's really just no excuse. Uh, for us not to be engaged um, on these issues. And so to those folks who are thinking about advocating for the first time, go to the website, go to bread.org, um, download those materials, educate yourself a bit, uh, and then just try it. Uh, see what works and what doesn't work, writing the letter or, or making the phone call. That was, that was terrific, Derek. Um, you know, when I look back at our advocacy and, and when we talk to our advocates, one of the things, well, two of the things that we tell them are most effective is just having a conversation and starting a relationship with your member of Congress. That way your member of Congress knows that you are part of the U.S. constituency for programs that fight global poverty. So often we hear well, we can't support these programs because there's no constituency for them in the U.S. Every single one of you that's joined us today is part of that constituency, and it is out there. So establishing that relationship with your member of Congress or with the staff helps that member of Congress know that there is someone in his or her district or his or her state that wants to see these programs continue to happen to be the best they can be and to then also be robustly funded. The other piece that that we always tell our advocates is effective is passion. And it's, it's closely linked to that other piece. But the fact that you're willing to advocate for programs that don't directly benefit you speaks volumes. Most, most folks who come to Washington to lobby, they have a very personally you know, vested interest in what they're asking for. That doesn't mean that what they're asking for is bad. But it's what sets many of you apart is that you're coming here or you're going to the district office or the state office or you're picking up the phone about an issue that really benefits a woman, a child, a father, thousands of miles away. Um, so a relationship and passion, those are the two things that I would say are most effective. And Danielle, from a USG perspective, <laughs> since you've been able to play both sides of the, of the table, now how do you see, well, how important do you see the role of your everyday advocate? So if I take off my USG hats, right, I can't really speak from that perspective, but as my Bread for the World, I am a Bread for the World member, so. Um, 
but you know, I, I think one of the there's a lot of competing priorities. Not you know, in Congress and even in the administration. We have if you look at the president's budget request, there's lots of things that we want to get done. Um, and so people need to know what's most important, and so they need they need to hear uh, from organizations, from constituents, from us. You know, f the whole spectrum, so that they know what to prioritize. I think when I used to work at Bread, one of the things we often heard was that the president's budget was a reflection of of the priorities of that country. And so, we, in a sense, we have we have we're communicating that. And so every um, every voice matters. Any other questions? I think as we um, get ready to wrap up, I really appreciate uh, the dis my distinguished colleagues and, and, and uh, Danielle and Tanya and Derek on, on the phone. I also just want to acknowledge um, all the folks who have participated who are participating in, in, in this uh, Google chat. I think we have over, uh, I want to say over close to 100 people who are participating on the Google chat. And a number of colleges and universities are, are represented here. I um, want to thank everybody who put this together. Just in, just in closing, I just want to say that you know, we, we have made some great strides in, in food aid and food aid reform. Food aid, the program itself, is, is, is a program that works. What, we, what we're talking about when we say reform is not to end the program or not to use this as a budget cutting exercise, but to make this program more effective, reach more people, and particularly as a, in a day and age where, we're, where the resources are limited. So as the federal government and our, and our leaders are looking at how to allocate resources and prioritize, you know, this is a program that, with the right type of, with the smart type of policy change, could really impact people. And as we talk about trying to make a goal to end hunger within our lifetime, food aid is going to be important in reforming the program so that we can feed a minimum four million people to 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 to, to even more beyond that. You know, it's going to be a key part of that. So. You know, from, from a brand perspective, for those who are interested in, in, in really getting engaged on this issue and, and many issues, please uh, visit our website. Food aid reform is going to be our, one of our big, big advocacy pushes this year. Um, with offering the letters, we give you an opportunity to write to your, write to your members of Congress. Uh, so go to www.bread.org um, and click on the tab that says Write to Congress, and you'll see a sample letter or a sample email. That talks specifically on reforming our food aid. Just fill in the blanks and send it off. And, and as my colleagues uh, said here, you know those emails, those letters, those phone calls really matter. So we really thank you all for participating and hope this is a first step uh, to you guys becoming a, a faithful advocate. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Good night. <laughs>